This video is a summary of the five required practicals that can be examined in AQA GCSE Physics Paper 2. When you're deciding what to prioritise for your final revision before the GCSE Physics exams, it's worth bearing in mind that 15% of the marks in the whole GCSE are for the required practicals, so they're more likely to come up than anything else. There are five of these in Physics Paper 2, or four if you're taking Combined Science. The first one is the Spring Extension Practical, which you might also know as Hooke's Laws Practical. Then second, we've got the acceleration required practical in which you might have used a trolley on a track. Then there's the ripple tank required practical. And then number nine is the reflection and refraction practical, which you only need to know about if you're taking GCC physics, also known as triple science. And then finally, there's the practical in which you look at different surfaces and see how they um, emit and absorb infrared radiation. In the first required practical for GCC Physics Paper 2, you suspend a spring using a clamp stand and a clamp, hang masses from it, and then use a ruler to measure extension, which is the final length of the spring after you add the masses, minus the initial length when there was nothing hanging from the spring. You can then calculate the force that's been exerted, either by using a Newton meter, or to be honest, by knowing the weight of one mass before you start. When you did the required practical, you may have displayed your data on a graph like this. But there's one thing about this graph that is really quite unusual. In science, we usually plot the independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. But when you did this practical, you almost certainly hung masses with a particular weight off the spring and then only afterwards measured the extension. So why have we flipped the axes in this graph? Well, there are two reasons. One is that it is possible to do this practical the other way around. You could stretch the spring until it's a certain length and then see what force is required to get that extension. But the other reason is actually a mathematical one. If we reverse the axes from what you might expect to do and plot extension on the x-axis and force on the y-axis, then the gradient is the same value as the spring constant, and that makes that calculation much easier to do. From this graph, we can identify where the limit of proportionality is. As long as Hooke's law holds, extension and force are proportional to each other. This means that you're going to have a straight line graph that passes through the origin. The graph has a continuous gradient, so we have a straight line. At the point at which the line stops being straight, we've passed the limit of proportionality. If the graph is plotted the other way around, with force on the x-axis and extension on the y-axis, then you need to be aware that rather than extending exponentially to the right, the graph will extend exponentially upwards when the spring reaches the limit of proportionality. If you're given some data to transfer onto the graph, then this will happen automatically, but it's worth bearing in mind in case you're asked to draw a sketch graph. To write a method for a six mark question about this required practical, you would firstly describe hanging a spring from a clamp that's attached to a clamp stand. Then you would probably mention clamping a ruler alongside. You can just hold the ruler in your hand, but the advantage of clamping it is that it ensures that it's vertical. You then measure the initial length of the spring before you've added any masses to it, and then you add a one Newton weight that's hanging from that spring. You measure the new length of the spring, and then you use that new length together with the initial length to calculate the extension. And you do this by subtracting the original length from the new length. This is repeated several times, and each time that you do, you add a further Newton. But it's important that when you do this, you don't exceed the limit of proportionality, because if we're trying to calculate the spring constant, we need the spring to still be obeying Hooke's law. You might have also included in your answer the actual calculation that you need to do to calculate the spring constant. So the calculation that's on the equation sheet is force, is spring constant multiplied by extension, but of course you would need to rearrange that. The seventh required practical usually involves using a glider. This is pulled by a variety of hanging masses along an air track. The air track is used because this is going to totally eliminate friction, which would have an impact on our data. Light gates are used to see how quickly the glider is moving at each point on the air track. It's possible to do this using two light gates or also, depending on the exact practical you're doing, using one light gate and using this together with the length of time that the um, glider is travelling for. This will allow you to work out the acceleration. As we add more masses, the weight or the force increases and therefore the glider accelerates faster. It's also worth bearing in mind that the exam board could ask you about this in a context that's slightly less scientific. So for instance, here we're asked about how a student can determine how the size of gravitational force acting on a toy train would affect the acceleration down a ramp. So in this instance, 
they've mentioned the ramp, so we'd start off talking about how we would position that ramp at a set height, probably by placing it on top of some blocks. And then we would place the train that they've mentioned at a set position. So we're always going from the same height, and therefore that's a control variable. And since they've mentioned that we're going to be investigating the size of the gravitational force, we could talk about having that um, train pulled by a pulley, or in this instance, we could just talk about adding some masses to the top. We would then need to say that we would position the light gate a particular distance down the ramp, and then we would release the train and start the stopwatch. So as the train breaks the light gate, that's going to give you a length of time and that's going to tell you how fast it's moving at that point. And we know that at the very start it was stationary, so it was traveling at zero meters per second. And then if we time it as we do it, we can then um, calculate how long it's taken for its velocity to increase from being initially zero to whatever it is when it passes through the light gate. We then need to repeat all of these steps, adding additional masses to the top of the train or to the pulley system, if that's what we're using. And then, as we said, we would use the time from the light gate and the length of the train to determine the speed. And we could put these together to work out the acceleration. So your initial velocity, of course, is going to be zero. The train length divided by the time it takes to break the light gate would give us the um, velocity at the end. And then the time taken is the time that you've measured on the stop clock. Required Practical 8 is about making measurements of waves, either in a ripple tank or by looking at a string with a signal generator attached. There are a lot of different ways that the exam board could structure a question about this required practical, but typically you might be asked how you could set up an experiment to collect data that would allow you to calculate wave speed. In order to do this, you need the wavelength and also the frequency. Wavelength is literally a length and you can measure it with a ruler. In the ripple tank, the places where the peaks of the waves are have more water underneath them, so less light gets through, and therefore it looks darker. And then the troughs are shallower water, so more light can get through and it looks lighter. These waves are moving, and so you can't really measure them in real time, but what you can do is take a photograph that also includes a ruler that you've put alongside, and then you can measure the wavelength on that static picture. One thing you can do to make your data more precise is rather than just measuring from one peak to the next peak, you could measure the length of 10 waves in one go and then divide that length by 10. Next, you need to think about the frequency. The normal way to use a ripple tank is to have some kind of oscillator or signal generator, which is causing a metal or wooden rod to bounce up and down and create the waves. And often that's going to have a screen on it and you can just read the frequency straight from there. But if that's not available to you, then what you can do is pick a point in the ripple tank and then count how many waves go past that point each second. And just like with wavelength, we're going to be more accurate if we measure over a greater time. So rather than saying how many waves went past in one second, you might choose to count how many waves passed in 10 seconds and then divide that by 10 to find the frequency. Once you have those two pieces of information, you can put them together to work out the wave speed. Or if you were trying to work out wave speed, firstly, then what you could do is have your ruler alongside the ripple tank, measure the time for one wave to travel the length of the tank by using a stop clock, and then use velocity is distance, so the length of the tank, divided by time, and you could also work it out that way. Although this question asks us how to measure wavelength, frequency, and velocity, we know that these three are connected by the same formula. So actually, in a real investigation, we could measure two of them and then calculate the third. We need to describe that we're aware that to do this we would use a ripple tank. So to measure the wavelength we would place a meter ruler alongside the ripple tank, then photograph the tank and the ruler, and measure the length of a large number of waves, probably 10, and work out the wavelength by dividing that distance by the number of waves. To work out the frequency we could either read this directly from the oscillator or we could count the number of waves that are passing a point in a fixed period. And as we've said, the longer the period, the better it is. So we would then need to divide the time um, to get the frequency. Finally, to work out velocity, if we weren't going to work it out from the other two um, values that we've got, we would again place a meter ruler alongside the ripple tank and then measure the time for one wave to travel the length of the screen using a stop clock. And then we could work out that the velocity or the wave speed is distance, which is the length of the tank divided by time. Waves can be reflected at the boundary between two different materials, and you need to be able to construct a ray diagram to show this, normally using just a plain flat mirror. The first thing that you need to draw is the normal. 
This is the imaginary construction line at the point where the wave is going to meet the change in media, and it's going to sit at 90 degrees to that surface. Then we can draw in the instant ray, and the angle of incidence is measured between that instant ray and the normal. The way I always think about this is there wouldn't have been any point in me drawing the normal if I wasn't going to use it. Then we can draw in the reflected ray and the angle of reflection. And the key thing here is that um, when we've got a smooth flat surface, the angle of incidence is going to be equal to the angle of reflection. You also need to be able to construct a ray diagram which shows how a wave is refracted at the boundary between two different media. And the typical example in school is a light wave going from the air into a glass block. Again, we start with a normal and then we draw in the incident ray and the angle of incidence. Now, if there wasn't any refraction taking place at all, my light would carry on along this path because light travels in straight lines. But what actually happens is something a little bit more like this. My glass block is denser than the air that the light started off in. And when light enters a denser medium, it refracts towards the normal. So that's what we see here. And then to come out of it, I would draw another normal. And this time we're going from the denser material to the less dense material. So my light is going to refract away from the normal. Different wavelengths of light refract by different amounts. So inside this block, the red and the blue light are behaving in a slightly different way. Now, because this is a rectangular block, the two sides of the block are parallel to each other. And that means that whatever happens when the light enters the block, the exact opposite thing will happen when it leaves. So even though they're split apart in the middle, when the light exits the block, it does so as one beam of white light. But that's not the case if you take something like this triangular prism because as the light enters the block, the red light and the blue light refract differently from each other. And that means that when they hit the far side of the block, they're doing so at different angles. And so even though they do refract back to where they were, they don't actually form up to form a single beam anymore. We get this spectrum instead. So the reason that this refraction happens is that as the wave enters the more dense medium, it slows down. Now, if the wave was traveling perpendicular to the surface that it's passing through, then the whole wave front slows down equally. So the whole light ray slows down and then speeds up together and you don't see the refraction. But where it hits the change in medium at an angle, it basically pivots around that point. The next required practical is about investigating how the amount of infrared radiation that's absorbed or radiated by a surface depends on the nature of that surface. That could be about the surface type, like is it shiny or matte, or whether the colour makes a difference. In order to test this, you need a number of identical cans or hollow metal cubes. They need to have the same dimensions but different surfaces, which is the independent variable. Everything else that could be changed needs to be kept the same. You fill the cans or cubes with hot water from the same kettle, so they're starting at the same temperature, and then you use a ruler to position an infrared detector at a consistent distance away from the can. You can also take the temperature of the water as a surrogate for this, because if the can's radiating more infrared, then its temperature will drop faster. But the data just isn't as valid. In this practical, you firstly take a series of containers that are the same size and the same shape, but have different surfaces. That's satisfying both the fact that my marker needs me to talk about controlling some variables, the size and the shape, and also that we need to change the independent variable. Another variable that we need to control is the distance that those containers are from the infrared lamp or infrared light source. Another thing that should be controlled is the volume of water in each container. And also this is going to be a more valid test if all containers have the same starting temperature of water. The top of each flask should be blocked and this is to prevent evaporation, which would therefore lead to heat transfer by convection. Then the infrared lamp is turned on and you measure the temperatures at various intervals for a time period. The particular time that you've picked isn't really important. It's just important that you're making regular readings and you're doing so for a sensible time period. If you've completed all of the key steps in the practical, then you're already looking at a level three answer. But to get that sixth mark, you need to make sure that you're including some additional detail that isn't vital to the practical. So that could be things like describing that having containers of the same shape and size is going to make sure that the surface area is the same or that placing the containers the same distance from the infrared lamp is going to ensure that the intensity of the infrared radiation is the same, or that having the same volume of water in each flask is going to make sure that the water temperature increases at the same rate. You could also include something like talking about the fact that putting the bung in each flask is going to minimise evaporation. 
Thanks very much for watching, and I hope you're now feeling a little bit more confident talking about your GCSE physics required practicals. If you did find this video useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE physics videos coming soon.